Hello. Sorry I haven't released a video in a long time. I've just been working a lot and the weather's been absolutely dreadful in Oregon. There's ice storms, rainy weather, blah blah blah. But enough of my first world problems and welcome to another episode of Forgotten Cemeteries Pacific Northwest. Today we're at Knights of Pythia Cemetery located in Rainier, Oregon, Columbia County. Alternative names, it's just KP, the abbreviation. So let's go meet some of the local residents and hear their story. A little background about this cemetery. It was established in 1883 with 100 to 500 burials per the Oregon Burial Site Guide. Sign out front says 1895 though, so I'm not sure about that. Find a grave shows 288 memorials so far, so still a tiny cemetery, um, most likely because it's kind of in the middle of nowhere. The town of Rainier is pretty close though, but to get up here it was quite a drive up the hill so it's kind of hidden i expected there to be more traffic but it's awful quiet so i guess that's a good thing for recording uh find a grave is showing the most recent burial was 2010 if i remember correctly um there's a great view of the columbia river river in mount st helens but it's kind of like really uh foggy today so I don't think we can see that <laughs> as far as the town of Rainier it was founded in 1851 and for such an old town the population sure hasn't climbed that much in 1890 it was 231 people living here 2020 the population was um, 1911 so not much of a change I guess my understanding is that there's all these smaller communities that kind of make up Rainier in the area but Rainier is most little me known for the famous uh, Trojan nuclear power plant Oregon's only commercial based nuclear plant. As you guessed, a lot of Oregonians were opposed to this and protests happened. People got arrested, but the plant still went up and was connected to the grid in 1975. However, a few issues were discovered, such as cracks and structural damage to important components of the plant, so it was shut down. There's a video of an implosion of the cooling tower from 2006 if you're interested on YouTube. It's kind of neat to watch. This area in general seems to have um, a few long lost grave sites. Uh, there's the Dibble House Burial Ground, which is a closed art gallery now from my searches. Two unmarked graves allegedly under an apple tree. One who was um, a guy named Merrill Blanchard, who was stabbed and then died during a brawl, uh, a bar brawl in 1875. Then the Gilbreth Mowick grave, which was interesting. Shows only two memorials on Find a Grave, but apparently there's like 30 burials there. Not sure if we'll ever know um, who exactly is buried there because it's on private property on a farm. I would have liked to visit that one. And finally, the schoolmaster's grave of William Riley Strong, Rainier's first schoolmaster. His marker is gone from time, but he's located somewhere on the property of a tow shop these days. So lots of cool cemetery history stories in this area, but unfortunately not accessible for my readings. So, Knights of Pythias. I think we've rarely come across this symbol on headstones, but they were founded in 1864 and the first frat to receive a charter from the United States. You'll commonly see FCB on the symbol, standing for Friendship, Charity, and Benevolence. Looks like they were heavily involved with the American Cancer Society, but guessing um, these older societies don't get many members these days. Um, you can join, but you have to be over 18 and believe in a supreme being, from my understanding. Today, we'll talk about a Union soldier who dodged death twice, meet the founder of Pittsburgh, Oregon, hear the story about the worst maritime disaster in U.S. history, meet a pioneer shipbuilder, meet a Confederate commander, learn the origins of a college mascot at the Northern Tar Hills, meet the owner of Cottonwood Island, stop by the grave of Rainier's oldest physician, and I believe there's some Woodman of the World markers here, so that took a while to get through, sorry. And finally hear the story of a woman buried here. Um, let's just say her husband took that old saying, if I can't have you, nobody can. Did not end well, FYI. Figures, upon arrival, it starts drizzling rain, so it's going to be a cold, rainy video, so sorry. First stop is Abbott Lewis Richardson, born in Canada, who appears to have moved to Columbia County around 1878. A write-up mentions he was a pioneer shipbuilder in the area, more specifically, a two-masted schooner called the Francis Alice, which was primarily used for deep-sea fishing, apparently. The only info I can find on that schooner, it was wrecked in 1905 in the Bering Sea. The crew survived luckily, but the Francis Alice is lost forever somewhere in the deep sea near Alaska. One thing that's challenging with the rain is it's hard to read the headstones, the ones that are kind of dirty, but I think I found the right headstone of John Forrest Buckby, 
the West Virginia transplant and a Civil War veteran, military service appears very common in this family. You'll see 9th West Virginia Infantry Company K and his son, James Buckaby, served in the same um, company, Union side, by the way. In addition, John's mother's father served in the Revolutionary War. John's son, James, would be shot in a knee during the Battle of Cloyd's Mountain. I was reading details about the battle and the fighting, and it was pretty, um, pretty interesting stories from the fight. Confederate commander Albert Jenkins decided to make one last stand against the Union force at Clo Cloyd's Mountain. He had a pretty strong defensive setup, and Union Commander George Crook would identify this like right away. He's like, well, don't know about this. So he decided on, a, on an artillery barrage, and this is where the West Virginians come into play. From my readings, this crew was very green, but was led by a physician named uh, Carr B. White for the specific charge that was about to take place. There would be heavy casualties, because I'm guessing not only did the Confederates have a strong defensive position, the West Virginia crew was very inexperienced. This is most likely where John's son James would get wounded during the fight, because it does show in the record that the 9th West Virginia Infantry was under White's command during this battle. It does get to the point in the battle where the Union forces break into the Confederate lines and some brutal hand-to-hand -hand combat would um, ensue. At one point, the leaves in the area like ignited due to musket fire, and some soldiers were literally pinned down in the burning leaves and burned to death, so not pretty. However, the West Virginia boys would eventually break into the heart of the Confederate stronghold and take over. This battle is considered one of the shorter ones during the Civil War, but one of the most intense and brutal ones, only lasting around an hour. However, a lot of it was extreme hand-to-hand -hand combat deaths. Confederate leader Albert Jenkins lost 23% of his force and was wounded during this battle. A Union surgeon amputated Jenkins' arm, but he would never recover, dying 12, de 12 days later. There's one grave located at this famous battle site, and that's of Captain Christopher Stewart Claiborne. His request was if he was to fall during this battle, he wanted to be buried on site. Uh, same headstone, but just wanted to give you a different view so you weren't bored of the view. But another interesting story from their battle was that one last effort by the South to hold a railroad bridge vital to the Confederate Army took place. They set up along something called New River, and when the Union forces arrived, they were pretty much unloaded on them. This fight would be three hours long, and one dismounted Union cavalry soldier was like ripped to shreds by a mortar shell. Upon a surgeon's examination, he discovered the young soldier was indeed a woman who was serving for the West Virginia Regiment. My understanding is that her identity is unknown and hasn't been discovered till this day. Um, back to John, his son James would survive the knee wound, luckily. I did read he was captured by Confederate forces and held in Andersonville, but he was eventually released, but geez, his son could not get a break. The write-up made it sound like he was on the Sultana Steamboat, which was transporting, transporting Union soldiers who were released during the Civil War. The steamboat's boiler explodes and kills 50 men instantly. The second boiler explodes, killing more people. Apparently this remains as one of the greatest maritime disasters in U.S. history. It was estimated to kill 1,800 out of 2,300 people on board. However, James survives this disaster, but is buried in Salem, Oregon. And here is Joseph Silva's headstone, born in 1835 in Santa Cruz, Portugal. I think that might be a first for us. Which is in the middle of nowhere in the North Atlantic Ocean, away from the world. Would have liked to have seen his journey to Oregon, but just couldn't find anything. Only info was that he was married to Catherine Wilson in Oregon during the year 1873, so um, early arrival for Rainier here. An interesting find in this cemetery would be the story of Samuel Houston King, who was born in Virginia in 1837 and a Civil War veteran, more specifically serving for the Confederate Army as a captain for the Missouri 2nd Artillery. Someone posted this cool pic of him in his uniform, and it's from uh, Find a Grave. In doing my research, he was part of the Clark's artillery, but after Captain Clark's death, King would be one of the handful of commanders to take over. One of their battles included the Elkhorn Tavern fight, which was the biggest battle west of the Mississippi during the Civil War. Apparently you can visit the Elkhorn Tavern at Pea Ridge National Military Park, and it's considered one of the best preserved battle sites of the Civil War. Believe it or not, we have another Confederate soldier buried at the cemetery, and that would be of James Calvin Kilby who served in Company F of the 52nd Regiment, North Carolina Infantry. This regiment took part in some pretty serious engagements, such as the Battle of Gettysburg, the brutal Battle of the Wilderness, which we talked about several times, and several other scuffles. And I did read one write-up that discovers the origins of where the college mascot, the North Carolina Tar Heels, comes from. 
A record from one particular fight describes that the North Carolina Confederate troops were abandoned by the Virginia crew for some reason, and they were just left to fight alone. Apparently, after the North Carolina crew scored a victory, they were sort of making fun of the Virginians, saying that they were going to put tar on the Virginians' heels to make them stick better during the next fight. Robert E. Lee is also quoted as saying, God bless the Tar Hill boys, referring to the North Carolina fighters. If you visit this cemetery, you'll see a headstone by its lonesome self leaning against a fence, and that would be a Peter Bros. But you would be in the presence of the founder of Pittsburgh, Oregon. He settled there in 1879, naming the town, and of course you've guessed by now, he moved here from Pennsylvania. He built a sawmill in the area. In 1892, though, the local townsfolk got fancy and removed the H from Pittsburgh. Guess they didn't want to be associated with the Steelers. Can't blame them. Today, not much in Pittsburgh, Oregon, just a popular stop off the highway called the Blue House Cafe, which serves wine, so good in my book. Sorry if the camera's at a weird angle, like this whole video. The cemetery's at like a slope. It's one of the stranger ones I've visited, and you'll see during the um, tour. I'll probably fall down the hill. But we're here at Frederick Cleveland Winchester's headstone. Frederick? Frederick. Yeah, fancy name. Born in New York in 1821 and a Civil War veteran. Uh, doesn't have the classic war vet marker that we're used to seeing, that little military style. But it shows he enlisted in 1861. I think he served in the 5th Kansas Cavalry based on the Civil War search. And um, that's where he was living during that time of the Civil War. Shows him getting wounded during the Battle of Pine Bluff. Post-war, he married Elizabeth Brown Winchester. And she is buried at the cemetery as well. I think her name's on the other side of the headstone. They apparently got bored with Kansas based on the write-ups. Imagine that. They moved to Oregon in 1875, so late arrivals who were a big part of the Rainier community back then, apparently. Buried underneath the leaves was the headstone of Dr. Alexander Powery McLaurin. Born in 1869, late for our taste, but he was considered one of the earliest practicing pioneer physicians in Rainier back then. Uh, looks like he came here in 1891. Sadly died at a young age of 45 of a hemorrhage of the stomach. Somewhere out there in the cemetery is the grave of John Milton Stamen, uh, but I don't believe he has a marker. But he was born in 1845 and came to Oregon in 1851, so young when he came. 1851 overall was a rough year because I read about two massacres that took place during that year, the Captain Patterson train and the Captain Clark train. The first one of the Patterson story didn't really have much info. The only thing I could find is what they when they arrived at Rock Creek at Snake River in July. They found a small party of Indians camp there. So um, Captain Patterson fires at them, like trying to scare them away, which didn't seem like a bright idea because the next day the train was massacred by Snake Indians and I believe there was only one claimed survivor of that massacre, a John N. Davis, who is buried at Marion County, Oregon. The second story um, has a bit more info and that'd be the Captain Thomas Clark massacre. This attack would be led by a Native American named Has No Horse. By age 20, this guy was leading the most powerful sub-tribe of the Shoshone Indians in eastern Oregon, Idaho, and western Montana. I guess his guerrilla tactics were highly effective, and his next target was the Thomas Train Wagon Train in 1851. Uh, basically, I think they just wanted to steal horses and supplies. In August, the Clark Train stopped for lunch like they normally would, and just happened to be close to a well-known location by Oregon Trail uh, travelers, none other than Massacre Rocks, located on the bank of Snook, Snake River. This area was apparently also referred to as the Gate of Death and Devil's Gate. So hey guys, let's take this way to Oregon. Anyways, the Native American warriors approached and chaos ensued. At one point, Grace Clark, the sister of Thomas Clark, tries to protect her mother and sort of like hugs her, um, but a bullet fired from one of the social warriors goes through Grace's wrist and enters the heart of her mother. Um, her, her mother obviously died that evening. Grace was hit again by another bullet, I guess, and the Shoshone tore her clothes off, but she kind of pretended to be dead to get out of it. What's odd is Grace remembers the warriors speaking American, and some of them being blue-eyed from her report, guessing she meant they spoke English. They begin to scalp Grace, but luckily um, Thomas Clark arrives on horseback and uh, kind of chases away the Native Americans. And What's really interesting about this raid is several men were seen with sandy beards, sandy beards assisting the Shoshone white males basically who were outlaws in the area. Guess they formed a little alliance with the Native Americans back then to steal horses. Alrighty, our last story is the saddest in the cemetery and that would be of Sarah Jeanette Walker Horton who has no marker from my understanding so that's a bit sad. So I tried to give you guys a nice view of the uh, 
I don't even know what mountain that is over there, but hope you like it. But I uh, couldn't find much on her except she was born in Illinois in 1872. Her mother, Emma Smith, is buried somewhere in Arkansas and died at the age of 26, a few years after Sarah's birth. No mark of Sarah's mom as well. And uh, her write-up made it sound like they built something called Greer's Ferry Lake over a bunch of graves, apparently. So Sarah must have spent time in Arkansas based on that story. Not sure when she came to Oregon, but appears she and her husband, William James Horton, owned a lodging house in Portland. In fact, Sarah was a clerk for the women of the woodcraft in that area, so that might explain why we have so many woodcraft headstones in this cemetery. Her husband was also a logger. Sarah at the time was working at W.S. Cobb and Company and filed for a divorce from William. Um, this didn't sit well with William, to the point it ate away at him, and he decided, we'll see about those divorce papers. William arrives in town December 26, 1916, so right after Christmas, which is odd, because when I wrote this profile up, it was December 26, so synchronicity thing. He goes to the barber shop where the owner of the Cobb Company was known to get a shave and make sure the owner wouldn't return back to his store anytime soon where Sarah was working. I guess he stands there for a few minutes, then makes his way to the Cobb store. So some scouting and planning was involved here. He enters the store, doesn't say a word to her, and shoots Sarah, and killing her. He then turns the gun on himself and commits suicide. Coincidentally, Sarah made a comment earlier that day that her husband threatened to kill her the day before, so I imagine she sort of knew it was coming, sadly. Upon investigation, they find two notes on William. One says that he can't live without his wife and therefore decided to kill her and himself. The second note was addressed to his son, dated on Christmas Day, instructing him to collect money due to William and his son would never see him again. So, uh, Merry Christmas. Appreciate your marriages. Alrighty, time for the tour and let's get away from the road as soon as possible because it is a little loud and it's starting to get busy for some reason. It was nice and quiet. Let's stop and see what we can, but there's the woodsman marker, which is quite frequent at the cemetery. And I don't know if that's because uh, the story about Sarah, uh, she was a clerk for the woodcraft group. Here's another one. Quite a bit of symbolism in this one, too. FLT, it's the odd fellows, correct? Friendship, love, and truth. Might have to pause the video once in a while because it's just so loud when vehicles come by. Wow, look at that moss growth. Like I said, I'd like to get away from the road. <laughs> Silva, talk about Joseph Silva's story. He's from Portugal. That is a unique headstone. Kind of that elongated egg shape. See, it's kind of on a sloped hill. Kind of a unique location. There's another pretty sophisticated. This might be the coolest Woodsman of the Woodcraft headstone we've seen. You can see there's the mallet axe going into the uh, wood. Wow, that's quite the marker there. Finally stopped the rain and that, this trip has been rough. 
And this is kind of why my videos slow down during this time of the year, because it's just the weather is so bad. <clears throat> and a lot of the cemeteries I like to visit are out in the middle of nowhere. Oregon Infantry. Huh. So there is a good mix of Civil War veterans here. Union and Confederate. You don't come across a Confederate commander too often, huh? That was a cool find. But as you can see, it long cemetery. <laughs> Definitely uh, we'll get your hiking in if you're trying to find people. It took me a while to find people at this one. Because uh, between the rain and the kind of the build up on the headstones, it was hard to find people. I think I couldn't find two individuals. And one was a doctor. I believe he's one of the first maybe the first physician in Rainier. I'm trying to remember his name. Hey, the Woodsman Memorial. It was kind of fun doing research on the Knights of, um, Knights of Pythias. A lot of YouTube videos were like all these conspiracy theories. They're like, they're so secretive. And I was like, I don't know, seem pretty transparent on their website, on their expectations, so that was fun, the research. Got one lonely guy down here by the fence. Ernest Spencer. Huh. Nobody else. Maybe there is headstones buried under all those leaves there. Waiting for a car to pass so you can stare at the cool mushroom growth on this tree. Oh, that is. There's one of our Confederate soldiers, CSA, that we talked about. And located just up the hill is King. Apparently he was a Confederate commander. There's this cool design. Can't really see it, but it looks kind of neat. <laughs> You guys can see it in the video. So that's a big water tower over there. Founder of Pittsburgh, Oregon, can be found over here. Looks like I'm lonesome himself. Your Bruce. Bruce. I don't think the Knights of Pythias Lodge takes care of the cemetery for my readings. It's like a Rainier Cemetery Association. I think they take care of pretty much all the pioneer cemeteries in this area. Headstone looks like it's about to cannot fall forward. Kind of pretty hidden underneath the tree. But I think 
that's all she wrote for this cemetery. Probably going to be a long video. Quite a bit of stories. And for such a small cemetery, interesting uh, people here and their stories. Anyways, hope you enjoyed this one. If you have any other recommendations for cemeteries to visit in Oregon or even southern Washington, feel free to comment below. Have a good one and stay safe out there.